Kavika, Kaheke, a Ona Pua. I was born in India. I was born in the southern state of Kerala. Um, India, as some of, the, some of you may or may not know, has 29 states, and each of them is very distinct. Different languages, often different religions, different cultures, different foods. Um, India, I mean Kerala, my state, is at, so I'm gonna move away from the mic for a second. India is shaped like this, it's a, it's a triangle. And Kerala is at the very southwestern tip of the country. Um, there's a legend about Kerala that I, I learned a couple of years ago um, that says that it was created by a warrior sage. His name was Parashurama. And he was one of the ten embodiments or incarnations of the Lord Vishnu, the preserver of the universe in the Hindu religion and tradition. So according to the legend, Parashurama stood on a lofty cliff and ordered the turbulent sea to recede. And then he threw his ax into the water. The sea obeyed his commands, and the land that rose out of the sea came to be known as Kerala, the land of abundance. So I want to talk about that ax for a second. When I came across that myth uh, or legend a couple of years ago, I found myself puzzled by the ax. When I think of a Hindu warrior sage, an ax isn't really what comes to mind. When I think of an ax, what I think of is the Timbers ad campaign, <laughs> right, of people with axes. So I did a little research on Parashurama to figure out why his weapon of choice was an ax. I mentioned earlier that he was one of the 10 incarnations of Lord Vishnu. Each of the 10 incarnations had a form, a physical embodiment. The first was a fish, the second was a tortoise, then they moved through several other animals before taking human forms. Parashurama was the sixth incarnation, and Parashurama, it turns out, was a lumberjack. So the ax was his tool of choice. I find, yeah, somebody said, huh, and that, that's exactly what I said when I found that out. Um, I find more and more that we, when we look back through our stories, our individual stories and our collective stories, we find these unexpected threads that connect them and run through our narratives. So when I learned that Kerala was created by a lumberjack, it felt like an aha moment. Like the fact that both my homes, my birth home and my adopted home, have lumberjacks as part of their mythology meant that I was meant to be here in this place. <laughs> so Parashurama created Kerala, the land of abundance, and it really is a lush and abundant landscape with beaches, coconut palms, thick forests, tropical vegetation, and an inland canal system that's so extensive that the waterways are still primary transportation routes. And you can still see people transporting supplies and livestock, rice and vegetables and cattle even, by boat, by narrow canoe, rather than by road. Our landscape informs our food. If you've eaten Indian food here in the US, you've most likely eaten food that comes from the north. Samosas, which I served, by the way, at my Lunch and Learn, Yes, Jocelyn was there. And we're thinking of calling these events samosas and salad with Sushila. So if you need a tongue twister, there, there it is. Um, samosas are northern, uh, you know, naan, unleavened bread made from wheat, tandoori chicken. These are all primarily from the north. In the south, we eat tropical food. It's spicier than in the north. Our curries are more often coconut milk based rather than tomato based. We eat a lot of fish and seafood. This is all sounding very PI, Pacific Islander, a lot in common here. Um, our carbs tend to be rice-based rather than wheat-based. So instead of naan, for example, we eat something called a dosha, which is like a crispy pancake made from fermented rice batter. And if you've never had one, Tiffin Asha, Northeast Killingsworth and 16th, does a pretty darn good job with a dosha. The language we speak in Kerala is Malayalam, and a person from Kerala is a Malayali. So I am a proud Malayali. 
One of the many things we Malayalis are proud of is that Kerala was historically a matrilineal society where property passed through the women and where the family name also passed through the female side of the family. I wish I could say that this meant that power also passed through the women, but sadly it did not, but we'll take what we can get. <laughs> Um, so to use my name to show you how this matrilineal naming convention worked, I'm going to walk you through it. My mother's ancestral home was called Puddhasheri Kalaikal. Now, calling it an ancestral home makes it sound very grand, but it was really just a tradition wooden house in a village. But houses had names, and my, family, my mother's family's house name was Puddhasheri Kalaikal. My mother's name is Maya, so she was Puddhasheri Kalaikal Maya shortened to P.K. Maya. Under this tradition, I should have been Puddhasheri Kalaikal Sushila, or P.K. Sushila. But my parents were part of the first generation to start using Western naming conventions, and I was instead given my father's name as my family name, becoming Sushila Jayapal. So I don't know if you all saw it, but shortly after I started work here, I did a name pronunciation video with a very charming and charismatic Rudy Duncan, son of Ben Duncan, where he demonstrated how to pronounce and how not to pronounce my name, <laughs> Sushila Jayapal. And you can imagine how much fun we would have had with Put Puthasheri Kalekal Jayapal. Maybe we can do that next time. <laughs> Uh, so a tiny bit more about Kerala, then I'll move on to the rest of my story. Um, Kerala is one of the most religiously diverse states in India. Just over 50% of the population is Hindu, 27% is Muslim, and almost 19% is Christian. And that's compared to just over 2% nationwide who are Christian in India. Kerala at one point also had a significant Jewish population created by two waves of Jewish migration, one that arrived as early as the first century CE after the siege of Jerusalem, and one that arrived from Europe after the Spanish Inquisition. And because of its coastal location on the spice route, Kerala was subject to waves of European colonization by the Portuguese, the Dutch, finally the British. So that lush tropical landscape I mentioned, it's a really layered landscape, coconut palms, canals, temples and mosques and churches and synagogues and very Victorian British buildings right next to traditional carved wooden Malayali houses. So I was born in Kerala. That's where my family's roots are. That's how I identify as Asian, as South Asian, as Indian, and specifically as Malayali. When I was about seven years old, my family moved to Indonesia where my father found a job and then to Singapore for a couple of years for another job, and then back to Indonesia, where I went to high school. Throughout that time, which was about nine years, we went back to India during the summer and stayed with my grandparents. And some of my most vivid memories of India are from those visits. My grandmother's prayer cabinet, it was like a shallow built-in closet in a little niche in the wall, and inside there were pictures of gods hung on the wall with jasmine garlands around them and oil lamps on the floor, and she prayed there three times a day. Of my grandfather sitting out on the veranda, which is what we call the porch, uh, sitting out on the veranda reading the newspaper, and me sitting next to him in this giant cane chair reading, strangely, Archie comic books that I was really, really oddly attached to, um, and of really vicious mosquitoes and the ceiling fan running at high speed to keep them away, and the food the doshas I talked about earlier, lime juice that my grandmother squeezed daily, and a sweet that I was addicted to called shakruperi, which is fried banana coated in brown sugar. So fried and sweet, what's not to like? Um, as different as each of those places I grew up in is, India, Indonesia, Singapore, what they have in common, other than all being in Asia, is that they're all incredibly diverse. I talked earlier about India's diversity, about the fact that it's composed of states that are like different countries, many of which were historically different kingdoms. Singapore is also diverse, with a stew of three very distinct communities, Chinese, Malay, and Indian. And Indonesia is incredibly diverse, with hundreds of islands, over 300 ethnic groups. In fact, India's national motto, Indonesia's national motto is Bineka Tunggal Ika, which means unity in diversity which fits really well with today's theme. So when I was thinking about one of the questions you asked us to think about, what are some of the factors that have enabled me to bring forward my whole self as an Asian Pacific American leader who helps to foster harmony and diversity? What I think about are those formative experiences. 
of growing up with a sense of being rooted in my identity as a Malayali, not just Indian, but Malayali, with very specific connections to family and food and place, and at the same time in these env environments that were so richly diverse. It hasn't always been easy to bring that whole self forward. In particular, the years right after I moved to the US as a 16-year-old to go to college were very confusing. By way of context, that was 1979, just six years after the decision in Roe v. Wade. I feel like many of you in the room were not here then. Um, I went from being surrounded by people who looked more or less like me to the very homogenous, very white environment of a small suburban campus in Pennsylvania. There were only a handful of foreign students, as they called us then, international students, maybe a dozen or so students of color. There was no API associ association or affinity group. I dealt with loneliness and alienation and the infuriation of questions like, and I quote, did you use elephants to get around in India? End quote. Really was asked that question and the answer was no, we did not. <laughs> From college, I moved to New York, where I worked at an investment bank, then law school in Chicago, then law firm in San Francisco, all environments in which I was one of the only people of color and sometimes the only API. At my law firm in San Francisco, for example, and this despite how diverse San Francisco was, even then, out of about 100 lawyers, I was one of three lawyers of color and the only API lawyer. It was often very difficult to bring my whole self forward, sometimes because I felt it would make my alienation worse, and sometimes because it was just such an effort to insist on bringing that whole self forward. But those underlying factors, connectedness to family, connected to place, to food, always food, were always there. Just sort of waiting for me to reach back, reach in, scrape away the uncertainty, insecurity, all that stuff that gets in the way and grab hold. One of the great things about getting older, I think, is that we keep becoming more ourselves, and maybe that's not so great depending on who we are, but <laughs> we, do, we do keep becoming more ourselves. We recognize that we don't really have time to be somebody else. And for me, the other factor in bringing my whole self forward, one of the most, if not the most important factor, has been my children. Our children demand that we are our best selves, our most complete selves. Even subconsciously, I think we work to model what we hope for them. Thinking about my children, brown children, mixed race children growing up in Portland, and wanting them to be able to bring their whole selves to their lives has been critical to my own journey. And now my journey has taken me here to Multnomah County to this room. I am so proud to be part of this organization. I am so proud to be part of this diverse Asian Pacific American community at Multnomah County and in Multnomah County. And I am grateful to all of you and the EOC for centering our stories in this celebration. At the end, I think this might be one of the most important contributions that we as leaders of our diverse communities, elected leaders and community leaders, which you all are, can make. Sharing our stories, listening to each other's stories, Honoring both the differences between our stories, the diversity, and the common threads, the harmony. Family, place, food, lumberjacks. <laughs> <laughs> and centering both that diversity and that harmony and those stories in all of the work that we do. I tell people that I am black inside an Asian body, all right? And <laughs> What I want to tell you about that, <laughs> what I want to say about that is, the, as blind people, we, uh, we followed the leads of black people in the, in the civil rights time. We learned so much, a lot of the politicking. There are two blind groups uh, in the consumerisms. One's kind of Republican and one's kind of Democrat, so you can imagine the tension in that. But one of the things about one of the blind groups was they learned from African Americans, from black people, how to navigate difficulties in the context of civil rights. The civil rights at that time was, you, was as you know, done out of compliance, and they dealt with race, and they dealt with gender, they dealt with religion, and they dealt with education, but people with disabilities were not even on the diversity bus. And as Rosa Parks moved from the back of the bus to the front of the bus, People with disabilities weren't even on the bus until about 1970 or 1973 when the Rehabilitation Act was passed. 
So being Japanese, born, I was born in Colorado, where my mother uh, was about ready to deliver me, and the doctor, a 90-year-old doctor, said, I don't deliver J people, I'll just say it, right? Past midnight, and of course midnight came and I wasn't ready, mom wasn't ready, so they, I was pulled out with forceps. And that was why, that was why we thought I was blind, but that didn't turn out to be the reason. But nevertheless, it started an entire journey of never knowing why was I experiencing di discrimination. Was I blind or was I Japanese? At the time we were institutionalized, we meaning the blind students, uh, I went to uh, away from home for nine months out of the year at the age of five years old so, so I could have an education. And it wasn't until the late uh, 1950s or 1960s that students who with disabilities could be in their own home territory. The problem I had early on was trying to go on dates. Did the girls discriminate against me because I'm blind or because I'm Japanese? And a, a woman told me in the 1980s, she said, Steve, there's a third reason why you were discriminated against. Would you like some feedback? And I said, bring it on. She said, that's because you're a jerk. So I guess I'm a blind jerk. And there's not a woman in the room who doesn't understand what I'm saying. Men, we are jerks sometimes. And the women are going to say amen to that, right? Yeah. Hey, women are going to say amen. Men are jerks. It's OK, right? So that created a whole nother problem. So where in the world does creating harmony come into this thing? I mean, we are all messed up, right? We are totally messed up. And we're all diverse. We're all weird and different. Turn to your neighbor and say, you are weird and so am I. Let's get that out of the way right now. You are weird and so am I. Oh my goodness. So what do we do with thing? What do we do with this thing about creating harmony? I'd like to work from three basic assumptions. We are more alike than we are different. Yes. And in that, I hurt, I love, I laugh, I play, I am a jerk, and so are you. Okay, <laughs> let's just get clear. All right. First assumption: we are more alike than we are different. Second assumption: each person has something unique to bring to the workplace. Number three, let us celebrate the differences in others. And that's what's beautiful about this day. I'm a total agreement with you, Commissioner. It is incredible to be in this room. I can't believe it. I'm just about, I mean, I'm about ready to jump out of myself. It is unbelievable. Now, one of the things I've learned, back to my story about learning from black people, and I'm saying black because whether you're African-American or from a different country, the reality is when people are discriminating against you, it's not because you're African-American, it's because you're black. Yeah. And it's because I'm blind, right? And so one of the things I loved in, in the early 1990s, if those of you that know Donnie Adair, he used to ask me to come and speak at MLK. And I learned about when you go to an, a predominantly black audience, it is fun because you get feedback all the time, right? <laughs> yes. And I loved it. And in my Asian culture, we say nothing to nobody. We just keep it shut down, you know? But so here I am at MLK my first time. And all of a sudden, I, I'm not talking. I mean, I'm getting talked back to. Preach. Keep going. Right on, brother. You tell them. Wrong direction. Where'd you go? <laughs> you lost. You way lost. Come on back. Come on, okay, now you're getting hot. Now you hot, you hot. Preach, keep it going, brother, keep it going, brother. You hot, you hot. There ain't nothing, there ain't nothing like being with an all black audience. Better yet, the rest of you who aren't black, go to an all black frequented movie theater. They talk to the screen. Don't you go in there, they're gonna shoot you. Oh, man, I love it. <laughs> Creating harmony from diverse perspectives. Now, you go to an Asian meeting. You know, somebody bring me a chair. I need a chair for a minute to demonstrate this part. This is a meeting of Asians, OK? Just, just bring a, a chair, and I can use it for a second. All right. That's all right. It's good. It's all good. It's all good. Right here? Right here. Thank you. So in an Asian meeting, we sit like this. So what do you think we should do about 
Multnomah County. Hmm. I don't know. What do you think? Do you, do you get my point? So in an Asian meeting, it's all quiet. Like it's like, if you wait on us, we ain't ever gonna get nothing done, right? You know what I mean? It's like, but it's harmony, dude, it's harmony. Now the other problem I have is when you're supposed to look at people, you know, like you're supposed to look at them, and when you look at people and still don't see anything, it creates problems, because you can stare at me, you can frown at me, you can smile at me, and I won't know and I won't care, <laughs> right? But there's still harmony, because we have laughter, we have challenges, we have questions, and that's true for all of us, isn't it? It's true for all of us. So let me just share thoughts, because I don't want to take too much time. We've got a, lot, a few more things on the agenda here at this, at this great gathering together. But have compassion with each other. We want compassion. We want inquisitiveness. You know, the inquisitiveness of asking questions. So what are you? How are you? Are you... You know, are you blind? Are you handicapped? Are you disabled? Are you Japanese? Are you Japanese American? Whatever that is, each person is going to have a different answer. It's their answer. It's your answer. It's my answer. And one of the things about what you're doing here is you're honoring, you are honoring the fact that I'm going to treat you the way you want to be treated, not how I think I should treat you. And that's a big stretch for some of us. Because I'm going to treat you based on how I think you should be treated, or I may even treat you based on my bias towards you, which may or may not be accurate. And one of the challenges for the third generation Japanese American group is we work so hard to assimilate into the American culture, our families didn't even teach us how to speak Japanese as a result of World War II. There's a whole generation of us that don't know how to speak Japanese because we were the bad guys in the war, right? However, there's still so much heritage that we have here, and what you're doing here at Multnomah County, please keep it going. Please keep it going. It is so good. It is so great. I'm going to walk away now because there's other people that need to get behind me. I have to put the mic down, so hopefully you're going to be able to hear me. But I need to demonstrate to you what happens when sometimes when you go meet somebody, I'm going to use my white cane to use the last illustration, and then I'm out. All right, so I'm going to put this down. And uh, the, the, the fun I have is going to the DMV, OK? <laughs> I really have a lot of fun going to the DMV. And I know that I'm going to be on stage, because people look, and I walk into the DMV, and I know, so I'm deciding, OK, I'm, it's performance time. It's show time, right? <laughs> So I'm playing it up big, and I'm lost. I don't know what I'm doing. And by now, everybody's watching, and nobody's saying a single word. So I decide, all right, the whole house is watching me. I might as well play it up. Could someone please help me find the line? So trying to find the line, and somebody gingerly helps me to find the line. And I'm waiting, waiting, waiting. And then it's finally my turn, you know, for the inevitable photo moment, right? And they always taught me. Look at the people when they, you know, so I, ha I ask, where's the camera? Because obviously I want to look straight ahead and do what I'm supposed to do, right? Finally, somebody in the back of the room said, I wonder where the hell he parked. <laughs> That you and I have is that we don't know where in the heck we're parked when we're relating to each other. Right. We don't know. How, what do I do with you? How do I talk to you? Do I talk louder to you because you can't see? <laughs> Are you a person of color, black, African American? Are you Hispanic or Latino? When I'm talking to groups, what I try to do, especially when I'm talking to a large house, is I'll use the terms interchangeably. Two of my best friends, and they're both gone now, Roosevelt Thomas, who was one of the diversity pioneers, wrote a book called uh, Beyond Race and Gender. He's, he preferred African American. Probably the first person, black person, Price Cobbs, I studied him in graduate school, never knowing that I'd get to be a colleague of his, wrote a book called Black Rage, and he chose the term black. 
See, and they're both pr predominantly incredible contributors to our work in diversity. They wanted, one wanted African American, the other wanted black. And so just ask each other. Ask questions when you don't know what to do. That's another harmony thing. It's have passion, ask questions, be dedicated and persistent. I'm out of here. Thank you so much. opportunity to embrace and to learn much about my Korean culture, which is why today's Asian Pacific American Heritage event is so meaningful to me. Culturally, I think I'm a bit of a late bloomer, but as I say, better late than never. And so I have taken that to heart. Uh, and the limited time that I have on this precious earth, I have a few things that I want to do. And uh, one of them was to uh, visit my birthplace. So in 2017, I had the good fortune to be able to travel back to Seoul, South Korea for the first time with my uh, now 20-year-old daughter. And because of that experience, I have found a really deep hunger that Never either it existed and I didn't know about it, or but it, it was awoken, awakened in me. I don't know, do we have any English teachers in here? Uh, awoken within me uh, to learn more about where I came from and who I am because of that experience. And so at the age of 59, I am now learning Korean at PCC. And yeah, it's great. <laughs> I'm so, I've learned so much, it's so fun. Uh, and I hope to travel back to Seoul again so that I can practice what I've learned. 
So, uh, you know, to be really frank with you, um, I've always struggled to find my place in the world. But I have to tell you that uh, I love this event and I love this community, that I have really found such fellowship and camaraderie in our API community. So last night, I had the pleasure of attending the 25th anniversary, anniversary gala for Urco's Asian Family Center. And I think our performers were there last night. Were they? Yeah. Unless there's two, two groups. I don't think there is. But they were incredible. But let me tell you, they know how to throw a party. And uh, yeah, I mean, there was dancing and music. It was so fun. Um, but I was really moved and touched to hear from, sorry, I'm a crier. Uh, from uh, some of our community members about their journey and their sacrifices, all in the hopes of finding a better life for their children and their families. So their stories highlight the challenges that many API residents face and the dark history, and the dark history that occurred here right in our own city. While I'm pleased that our Oregon legislature designated March 28th as Minoru Yasui Day to recognize his courageous stand against military orders that resulted in the forced removal and imprisonment of over 110,000 persons of Japanese ancestry during World War II. I am deeply saddened that our criminal justice system played a part in this act of civil disobedience. In fact, as many of you probably know, the jail cell that Yusui was incarcerated in sits in our downtown detention center. The good news is that it's going to be donated to the Oregon Nakai Legacy Center Museum. But because of his bravery, in 1983, the Commission on Wartime Relocation and Internment of Civilians concluded that the incarceration of Japanese Americans during World War II was a grave injustice. And the decision to incarcerate them was based on racial prejudice, wartime hysteria, and a failure of political leadership. I find it interesting that the Commission on Wartime Relocation cited the failure of political leadership as one of the causes for this inhumane treatment. We continue to live in a, in a society where political leadership is at a premium. Some of you may be aware that I changed my party affiliation last summer. And I'm not here to talk about partisan politics, but what I do want to talk about is about identifying embracing, and fighting for what you believe in. This was an incredible personal decision for me. It was the right thing to do for me. And I made that decision for myself, no one else. And while it seemed that nearly everyone had an opinion, both good and bad, about my motivation, I had to do what was right for me. And I believe that if you're not part of the solution, then you might very well be part of the problem. We can no longer remain silent or complacent about the racial, social, and environmental injustices that are being encouraged, promoted, and even rewarded in our world. We must show up, we must stand up, and we must speak up. The values that I cl hold close to my heart serve as a source of inner strength for me and have em empowered me to take risks and to speak my mind which is why I have found such joy and purpose in serving as your county commissioner. There have been so many firsts for me personally and for this board. I'm so proud to be the first Asian American and the first Korean American ever to be elected to the Multnomah County Board of Commissioners. Thank you. And I'm thrilled to have Commissioner Jay Jayapal join us to continue our legacy as the second majority minority board. Our diversity is our strength. We all come from such vast backgrounds, life experiences, and upbringings. And it is this diversity that enables us to see the challenges before us and address them head on. I want to thank the EOC for bringing forth the Workforce Equity Strategic Plan. It is through your persistence, your courage, and your heart that the board stands with you to address the institutional racism that exists in our county. 
I'm so pleased to see equity and diversity metrics being interwoven, not only into our workplace, but also within our labor agreements and contracts. You all serve as an example of what can be accomplished when everyone is invited to the table and has a voice in the room. I believe that we are at a crossroad. The decisions and policies that we make as a county, a state, and a country will have life-altering consequences and impacts for our families and future generations. And the urgency of these decisions have never been more profound. Multnomah County is home to over 60,000 Asian and Pacific Islanders, and yet many times the issues facing our communities are glossed over. Much of the data collected on us would imply that we are one homogenous group. We are not. And the more we can disaggregate the data and analyze the unique challenges that face our diverse communities, the better we can close those disparities. But there is strength in numbers, and by supporting collaborating and advocating for one another, we can shift policy to address systemic barriers for all of us. There are so many ways to work toward improving outcomes for our Asian and Pacific Islander communities. It starts with awareness and a grassroots effort. We need additional API community members to become more involved by volunteering, running for office, expanding our networks, and making our voices heard at meetings of local and state governments. These kinds of efforts can and do result in significant policy shifts. I am proud to have supported the many API leaders in our community and will continue to encourage our community members to step up into leadership roles. Today's theme of harmony in diversity is so important. It re reminds me of the African proverb, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. We still have a long ways to go, but by working together, I know we will all get there. Thank you so much for this incredible opportunity to share this wonderful day with you. Thank you. Thank you.